This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All-American Legacy Podcast. An inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are all American all the way. Welcome back to the All-American Legacy Podcast. This is Dan Bailey. Today, we return to World War II in late 1944 during the wake of the Allied forces' successful D-Day invasion of Normandy, France. It seemed as if the Second World War was nearing an end. On December 16th, with the onset of winter, the German army launched a counteroffensive with more than 200,000 German troops and nearly 1,000 tanks that was intended to cut through the Allied forces in a manner that would turn the tide of the war in Hitler's favor. The battle that ensued is known historically as the Battle of the Bulge. The courage and fortitude of the American soldier was tested against great adversity. Nevertheless, the quality of his response ultimately meant the victory of freedom over tyranny. We're going to hear from the paratroopers who were there and found a way with their unbreakable resolve to succeed where so many others might have failed. Here is Lieutenant General Retired Jack Norton, the Division G3 at the time, and then Lieutenant Colonel Retired James Maggie Magellis, explaining what the 82nd Airborne was up to and what initially happened when the Germans launched their offensive. We came out of Holland in about mid-November, and we went to a French base camp called Cisson, right outside of Reims. And again, we had our losses and we had our replacements. We had some retraining to do. So we had hardly gotten out of Holland before the Germans made their big attack through the Ardennes. On the night of December 16th, we got word that the Germans had made a breakthrough in, in Belgium and they were heading for Antwerp and then they were going full speed. They called General Gavin, who was the 82nd Airborne Division commander, and said, uh, you're now the Corps commander because General Ridgway, the Corps commander, is in the States for Christmas. Everybody was celebrating the holidays. and So the Germans caught us by surprise. And they broke through our lines in the Ardennes area where we had new troops. And their objective was to seize Antwerp, a port which they could use and at the same time would divide the British and U.S. forces and give them a stronger position from which they could negotiate some kind of a settlement. We were demanding unconditional surrender, but they felt that if they could achieve a victory and control something, that they could then salvage something out of it because I think they realized they weren't going to win the war. General Gavin, acting as the Corps commander, studied the situation and correctly concluded that the main German thrust was on the northern shoulder of the bulge. Based on this assessment, Gavin ordered the 101st to establish roadblocks at Bastogne, and he sent the 82nd Airborne to Verbamont. The 101st and 82nd Airborne were both on leave recuperating and training after the high-cost battles in Operation Market Garden, for which they were yet to receive a full replacement of men and replenishment of supplies and they were quite a distance away from the front, some 150 miles. Most men who had fought in Holland were given six-day furloughs, so some of them had been on leave in Paris or London. Men were recalled and packed into troop-carrying trucks headed to the front lines. The 82nd was in place by December 19th. However, they were not properly equipped for the frigid, snowy weather they were about to encounter. Don Jakeway, a sergeant with the 508th, recalls just how extreme the weather was and what he and his men did to cope. When we get up in there and it starts snowing and getting cold in the daytime, I think it was 23 below zero in the daytime. Then it got cold at night. <laughs> but uh, the whole thing of it is we'd dig foxholes and get the guys doing something, you know, and let them rest for an hour and then we'd move. Maybe we'd move another 100 yards and we'd dig foxholes again. You had to keep them alive some way. 
and uh, we kept moving around this Fremont Ridge area. Uh, but we are not moving out of our combat area. We just moving, giving them something to do. And uh, during the course of doing that, we had we had a lot of people that lost had frozen feet. We call it trench foot, but many many of them. There, in fact, there was probably in many veterans in the Ardennes or in the Bulge uh, that we lost because of frozen feet or trench feet. As anything, because see, we still only had our jump boots, and I had an extra pair of pants. OD pants and my jump suit on, and that's it. And, and the jump jacket with an extra shirt. That's about all you had. And uh, eventually, they did bring up some overcoats, uh, which I never did get. They brought up some uh, uh, over overshoes, which I never did get. But I kept myself from freezing my feet. I would take I had toilet tissue. I mean, where, where I ever got it, I don't know, but I, I had some. And I'd take my boots off and wrap my feet with the paper. And leave my strength, they leave my laces loose on my boots, and my feet never froze. Took care of them that way. George Meestout, commander of the 50th Field Hospital under the 82nd Airborne, couldn't believe the conditions or the number of troopers being treated for cold weather injuries. And we had snow uh, well, uh, uh, the whole time we were there. It was between a foot and two feet deep, and temperatures were about 10 degrees. Now, how you fight a war with 10 degree temperature and two feet of snow is terrible. The soldiers, it's absolutely terrible for them. They, they, they spend all their time trying to keep warm, and they can't use their rifle, because if, if the hand touches a rifle, their, their flesh sticks to the rifle. They get trench foot. Well, one day I was a triage officer for the division and I ordered the evacuation of 500 men just because of frostbite. We had jump shoes, which are leather boots really, and galoshes. Now if you walked in snow with your jump boots, they got wet. If you put the galoshes on, you sweated and they got wet. So there was no way you could really uh, do anything except have wet feet. Once again, Maggie Magellis. We went into Belgium completely unprepared for winter weather and for what we were to face. And again, we spent 62 days in combat. And we either went in to try and find the Germans to stop them, their forward advances, and once we did that, to push them back, which we did. So besides battling weather, of course the All-Americans engaged with the Germans as well, mostly heavily armored ones. Here's Jake Way again, talking about the interactions with the tanks and how the heavy snow could actually benefit the All-Americans. But in our fighting with the 82nd, we, we fought all over the place, you know, cutting off roadblocks, fighting tanks. We had some real dandy experiences with tanks. And uh, these guys were out on outpost and they, um, they had some ponchos, like, like rain capes, and they covered them over them and made a place and they covered it over and laid down during the night it snowed again real heavy. And they were covered up with snow. Well, the, one of the guys woke up and he could hear a German voice and they looked and he could see this patrol coming up, the, coming up this hill toward him. Well, they let them get a little push, and once they jumped up out of that snow and started firing at these guys, we scared them to death to begin with. Them. So they started firing at these guys, run down, they went into the house, and they fired, we, these guys fired through the house, and went, and you see them going out the other side. Well, the old story is, it said, that they, they called us guys devils and baggy pants, and they never knew where we were. You know, this, we were just all over the place, and they were, they were scared of the Red Devils. Unfortunately, as scared as the Germans may have been of the Red Devils, that didn't stop them from finding a way to take Jake away out of the fight. Colonel Mendez sent down for me and one of my squad wanted me to report. So I went up to him and he says, I want to take your squad. Now we carried all automatic weapons. We had one guy carrying a German spy German and I had a, uh, I carried, still carried my M1. I was the only one, but the others had Thompsons and uh, automatic weapons, had a BAR. Brownie automatic rifle. And he wanted us to lead point for the battalion. 
And what the story was, there was a road going up through this woods, and there was an S turn in the road, and right in that S turn was an 88, and we couldn't get through. So they wanted us to go up there and see if we could knock out the infantryman and the, and the gun and the weapon. So I'm going along this bank, and I would never let anybody go ahead of me. My job was squad leader, so that's what I was doing. I'm walking along this bank, about this much of me up above the bank, walking along real slow, and I got shot right through the chest, Went right through there, from out back of my shoulder blade. Knocked me off of this bank, and uh, of course, I was red all over from pressing the gushing out of my mouth and everything, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and I was going in there and all at once another bullet just above my head knocked a bark right off of this tree, and so I, I tried to get over as much as I could behind this tree, and, and it hit the tree again, another one hit the tree again, and, and I finally get over there and I said, man, I must have passed out. And then I came to, and the medic was working on me. He was taking my boots off. He thought I was dead. And I told him that I, if I could reach my 45, that I'd probably shoot him. You know, I didn't know exactly what I told him, but and he started crying. And so I thought you were dead. And I said, well, I'm not. And I think the only thing that saved my life is because it was so cold. Uh, and of course, I bled internally and stuff. But so he got me back to the first aid station, Kathy, and uh, I laid there till about six o'clock, and they had me bandaged up. I couldn't drink anything because I was wounded in the chest and I was thirsty. So they loaded up, they loaded up two German wounded and another GI and myself and we had a, a, a driver of this ambulance called the Meat Wagon. And we started back to the division headquarters at Liege. That would be the end of the war for Jake Way, but he went on to make a full recovery. As the most decorated officer in the history of the 82nd Airborne Division, Maggie himself was no stranger to intense fighting. I was in some very serious fighting, and I was uh, got a silver star in a battle, early battle for the city of Chinot, and then another later on in a battle for Harrisbach, another city in the Battle of the Bulge. Harrisbach was, uh, we knew that there was a, a large uh, German contingent there, and so they planned to attack with two battalions out of the regiment. My battalion, the third battalion, and the, and the second battalion uh, from the south. And we, we went 10 miles through deep snow, fighting elements and outposts of, of the, the German forces to take a position where we could attack Harrisbach. And we were gonna spend the night there in this cold winter below zero without blankets, without any cover, without any shelter, without anything an attack in the morning when the Germans came out of town at us in a larger force. The regimental commander, Colonel Tucker, hollered out for me and my buddy, Rivers, and he said to me, Maggie, take them two cans, we had two tank destroyers, and take that town, get in that town. That was the only order we had. And all of a sudden, we were in the middle of about 250 Germans. I was a platoon leader, I mean, they had 26 people. And my other buddy with the other platoon following me, they had about the same. And we opened fire on them. The, the Germans panicked and, and we just unloaded on them. A tank comes out of the, from the side road and starts firing at us with a machine gun. And I was leading the element of the attack and the men all took for cover. And I, as a platoon leader, then instinctively, and I say instinctively because we'd already been in combat almost two years. There was nothing by the book anymore. I charged towards this tank, but I was able to do it in a concealed way because it was a wooded area and I could duck in and out and get close enough. They didn't see me and I got close enough where I could throw in an explosive grenade against the side of the tank. And then, then it was quiet. And so I came back and I said, okay, now let's, let's take this town. And we did. That evening when we captured the city, we had killed by, by my calculation uh, 180 Germans and taken over 200 prisoners. And we never lost a minute. Maggie was nominated for the Medal of Honor for his actions in Hirschbach that day, but was ultimately awarded a Silver Star. 
Just one day after Maggie's actions in Hirschbach, Cipriano Gomez recalls the 508's actions in a whole time. Oh, late in January, orders were given throughout the front for a big push. And our objective at that time was whole time Belgium. That is where, in whole time, where our first sergeant was uh, performed a deed where he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, we had taken whole time, we had taken about 90 prisoners. And whole time was like the axle from which radiated five roads. And at that time, the tanks, the trucks, nothing could move on the, uh, away from the roads. They had to use the roads. Mm -hmm. That was the only way of getting around because of the uh, weather and all that. So we took whole time. The first Sergeant Gomez refers to as First Sergeant Leonard A. Funk, the third 82nd Airborne Division paratrooper to be awarded the Medal of Honor for heroic actions in World War II. At this point, the Germans had been pushed back into Germany and the Allies were advancing. Very soon after, the 82nd was relieved and sent back to recuperate in Reims. This was the end of the bulge for the All-Americans. With all the adversity they face, General Norton isn't quite sure how the 82nd pulled it out. Because I say the weather was terrible, the Germans had the advantages of the heavy equipment, the tanks, the artillery. And I guess we just beat them by uh, sheer guts. But we took heavy losses. During the course of the roughly two month long battle, some 500,000 Germans, 600,000 American, and 55,000 British troops became involved. The Germans lost 100,000 men, killed, wounded, and missing, 700 tanks, and 1,600 aircraft, losses they could not replace. Allied losses, the majority of them incurred during the first week, included 90,000 men, 300 tanks, and 300 aircraft. Looking back at what these men endured in the Battle of the Bulge is unimaginable for many civilians living in the comfort and security of today's modern society. Their achievements and losses fighting the incomprehensible firepower of virtually indestructible German armored tanks and fanatical Nazi SS Panzer Grenadiers in extreme cold when the simple act of falling asleep meant death. The all-American story of the Battle of the Bulge is above all the story of paratroopers. Often isolated and unaware of the overall picture, they did their part to slow the Nazi advance. General Gavin wrote in his after-action report, Men fought, at times with only rifles, grenades, and knives against German armor. They fought with only light weapons, in waist-deep snow, in blizzards, in near-zero temperatures, and in areas where heavy forestation and the almost total lack of roads presented problems that only men of stout hearts and iron determination could overcome. Before we go, we should address one of the great all-American stories that still lives on today. There's a famous poster, it's even in our headquarters, of a young paratrooper named PFC Vernon C. Hout, 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, leaving the front lines at Odermont, Belgium, January 6, 1945, saying, I'm the 82nd Airborne, and this is as far as the bastards are going, while talking to soldiers from the 7th Armored Division during the Battle of the Bulge. The quote, however, was actually originally attributed to a Private Martin from the 82nd Airborne Division who was digging in outside St. Veith. According to the original story, captured in the original Center for Military History archives, Martin was talking to tankers from the 814th Tank Destroyer Battalion who were moving back from the line. He said, Looking for a safe place? Well, buddy, just pull in behind me. I'm the 82nd Airborne, and this is as far as the bastards are going. So the original version of this story was that Hot did not say the quote. Martin did. 
The first recorded instance of the picture of Hutt, together with the quote, comes from the 1989 John C. Andrews book, Airborne Album, 1943-1945, Normandy to Victory. However, if you look at the original poster, which was created sometime in the 1970s, the quote is correctly attributed to Private Martin, but with the picture of Hot, not Martin. Both Hot and Martin survived the war. There is no record of either of them ever confirming this story. Given the nature of the way the Center for Military History recorded second and third hand accounts of these battles, we have our doubts that anyone actually said this. So this story one of the most enduring myths of the 82nd, just may never have actually happened. It's accepted as fact and written as fact in that it's a story that's been handed down and never really questioned. Well, that's it for this episode. The All-American Legacy Podcast is brought to you by the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office. Please send us a note at 82nd Airborne Division PIO at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this show, Leave us a rating and a review. This helps others to find the show. Tune in again in two weeks for an all-new episode of the All-American Legacy Podcast. Thanks for listening. All the way.